Hello, I'm some idiot named Barry Boyer. We're going to talk about cable and connectors here. This is going back to the early days of Telegraph. Yes, I'm talking cowboys and Indians. To the days of Western Union Telegraph, which I worked for for over 10 years. We had many things working there, and some of us were the elite. I was a wire chief. Yes, I was also a super tech. Okay. Some of the uh, infrastructure and the cable and connectors uh, that I was uh, exposed to in the early days were, were carryovers from the 1880s. Uh, early connectors were soldered. Um, I happen to have an old porcelain connector here. Uh, the early versions of this were actually wood. And this is how we connected things. Now, in today's modern environment of punches and patches, uh, well, you guys kind of have it made. In the early days, we had soldering irons, big, massive soldering irons that were heated and running all the time. And connections were soldered. Uh, early on, uh, they were adopters of other connection methods, uh, wire wrap being a part of it. This is a 300-pin Hamako block. You had hard wire on the bottom and uh, cross connects on the top, and they were in groups of 100. So this is a 300 pair. Another type of wiring connector was uh, a wafered block. It was still wire wrap. One side was the hard wire. The other side was the cross connect. And both the Hamako and this version here, which actually says Western Union Telegraph Co., uh, were in groups of 10, so it made it pretty easy to count, but you still had to have good eyes. We had these wonderful tools. We would strip the cross connect wire, cut it to length, and either with a manual uh, turning tool or with the wire wrap, You'd actually feed down a cross connect in the top part of the hole, place it over the wrap, and through pulling this, it would actually wrap around the connection point. Uh, really efficient uh, for central office where things were mostly permanent. In the customer world, things uh, kind of changed rapidly, and then along comes the phone company, and they kind of did their own thing. Most of you will recognize a 66 block. This one here says a Cat 5 66 block. Let me tell you, I was part of the early 80s experiments with the first Synoptics 1000 Ethernet concentrator. And when somebody said you could do Cat 5, well, back then it was Cat 3, and then eventually Cat 5 on a 66 block, there was a lot of controversy. The 66 block, uh, like the uh, AT&T 110 punch downs, use what's called IDC, or Insulation Displacement Connectors. That means... It goes through a little V-shape. The wire punches through a little V-shape, and it strips out the insulation and makes contact on the center core wire as you punch it down. Now, believe it or not, 66 blocks, 110. Uh, later on, it was Bix by Northern Telecom. I have a Bix tool here somewhere. Here it is. Bix was similar to the 110 punch down, where 110 had a little divot that would cut the wire as you punched it through the connector. Bix came along, it was very similar, but it had a little scissor motion. So as it punched, it would actually cut the top of it. Uh, there was another connector that, that did pretty well in its day, and it was called Crone. And Crone had some patching capabilities. It was out of Germany. Uh, and Crone was extremely expensive, but it had its places because you could patch. Uh, you could patch your cross connects easy. You could actually break the connection side versus the cross connect side where you might have uh, hard equipment and then connected to other equipment like telco lines versus line cards, you could actually patch in the middle of this with Crone. Now what's interesting is Crone was a takeoff uh, of what we used in the central office. Uh, back in the early central office days, we had massive patch panel bays, thousands and thousands of, of, of connectors where you would actually patch a line cord. Here's an old uh, tip and sleeve, not even tip ring and sleeve. Uh, it was a, a material coated paper tip and sleeve and you'd actually patch into the circuits. You had hard wire on top and, and uh, cross connect on the bottom or vice versa if somebody installed it wrong. Uh, this is an early patch. Uh, it was soldered connectors. Again, back in the day, everything was soldered. Very labor intensive, but that's how things were done in the phone company or Western Union back in the day. Remember, I was a super tech. Okay. So along comes Crone, um, where previously with, with uh, 66 and 110 and Bix, 
You had to lift cross connects, hook up jumper cables, test leads. You couldn't isolate things easily. Crone solved that uh, by coming up with a patching system very much like the jacks were. And here's an example. A, a, a Crone patch cord has little connectors in it, little wafered connectors. And you would actually split the contacts as you went into it. So it was quite effective for isolating and troubleshooting without lifting the jumpers. And it was great for uh, troubleshooting because you can mix and match cards and connections without moving the cross connects. Um, the early jacks were, uh, actually they were multi. It was tip ring and sleeve, tip and ring, tip sleeve. Uh, and then it was multiple connector points with a tip ring sleeve. And you could have multiple sleeves uh, behind it. Here's a, a close-up of an early solder jack. And you can see uh, when you patched in a connector, you actually touch the, touch the tip and the sleeve. And there you've got it. Later on, they developed a, a three-conductor version of this, tip, ring, and sleeve. It was called a 310 connector. And then shortly after that, uh, there was what was called the Bantam jack, which is a lot higher density. And these are still around today in central offices. It's tip, ring, and sleeve, but it's a much smaller profile. Consequently, the jacks were a lot smaller as well. So over the years, infrastructure developed into basically what I'll call two things, inside plant and outside plant. This is phone company terminology that was used for 100 years. Uh, it's still referred to today in the phone company realm of things, inside plant and outside plant, but now we have the added uh, infrastructure that we'll call customer premise. And this is the, kind of came about in the, uh, the 80s and early 90s into what we now, now know as a uh, structured wiring system within corporate offices. Uh, even data centers uh, contain that. There's been lots of mediums for this over the years. Uh, thick cable, uh, underground cable, buried cable. We learned early on about rodents eating through cable. Uh, if you're a smart person, you're, you're installing your own cable in your backyard from that phone company box, be careful. Uh, they do have rodent-proof buried cable. If you're, you're going to run something on the outside of your house that isn't uh, UV protected, it will rot. Your cable that you staple along the eaves of your house or just lay along the ground, it will rot. It makes special UV cable, just like they make special UV uh, wire ties. You take a regular wire tie from Home Depot and tie up some stuff in your backyard, and within a couple of years, it's going to disintegrate and just break. So don't go cheap. Do your research, okay? So we talked about uh, wire wrap and solder. Um, I talked about 110, which is uh, the, the predominant uh, punch that we find in a lot of places today. Um, the, uh, the early days of Ethernet didn't really have any standards. As a matter of fact, when, when I installed the first Synoptics 1000 concentrator in Palo Alto with Eric Varja and um, Doug Teeter at West Coast Wiring, Eric Varja was the uh, lead engineer, one of the lead engineers at Synoptics. Um, they just happened to pick, and I really don't know the story, but they picked the pinouts for send and receive on Ethernet as 1, 2, 3, and 6, which we still use today. Um, and it's carried over with the, the higher rate speeds that we accomplish through twists and, and uh, noise cancellation, etc. Um, in the early days, I remember we stripped out, it was a 200 pair underground buried cable. We had to find pairs without H88 loading coils. We found literally free wires in this 200 pair cable, stripped them off, used butt connectors or beans to crimp a little bit of an extra length on it, and we ran it into a biscuit block. Uh, and we pinned it out one, two, three, and six, and, and that went into the first. Uh, we had some compact uh, 286s with some nicks in them. And things like collision domains and stuff like that really didn't exist then. It was, uh, let's just get it working and, you know, let's see what we can do. Previous to that, there was uh, basically for the LAN side of things, uh, you had uh, RG8 cable. DEC was infamous, infamous for RG8. It was that big, thick yellow cable. You'd circle it uh, on a plywood wall because you had these, you know, 12 inch vampire tap transceivers with an AUI cable. You actually had a tool that you would bore in through the, the coax itself, through the, sh the shield, maybe a belfoil shield underneath a stranded shield, 
and you'd actually touch, it was a certain depth, you'd touch that center core in the coax, and you literally clamp this 12-inch square box, this transceiver, you clamped it on the cable. But they had to be spaced apart, so this coax that you had circled around your backboard had black lines on it, and you had to, those were the, the closest you could get. So if you had, if you needed, uh, you know, 10 transceiver connections to whatever hubs and stuff you were going to, you had to have 10 of these vampire taps, and so you just clamp this thing to the wall and, you know, on this big circle, and you have these vampire taps all over. And it wasn't very flexible, and it wasn't very pretty, and it didn't last very, very long. But it was bulletproof. Um, that kind of technology existed for, well, quite a while, quite a while. So along comes hubs and now switches, and, and you know, we have auto partitioning when things break. In the early days, just grabbing one, two, three, and six on some sort of biscuit block, uh, and you made your own cables. You you got, and I'm, I'm going to use this loosely, you had an RJ45 plug, uh, and you pinned it accordingly with whatever you might happen to have. It could have been just a couple of pieces of cross-connect wire, and that was your line cord. Um, and people are often misled by punch types as well. When you punch up an ugh, RJ45, when you punch down regular solid core wire, there's special solid core plugs. Uh, most patch cords today are stranded, and you need stranded plugs for that as well. There was flat satin stranded, 8-pin, like the, uh, the line cord of your telephone that is, you know, two, four, or six wires. It's stranded. Go ahead and cut one and take it apart. You need a stranded plug. It's actually got uh, two inline clips in the side of that connector, and that's, that's how it breaks the insulation and makes the contact. Um, using the wrong plug for the wrong jack and the wrong application because there's flat connectors and round connectors, stranded connectors, solid connectors. Get the right one. <clears throat> They're kind of hard to see as well. You really need to have a good eye uh, and look at the thing sideways and you'll know what I mean. The solid ones have actually like three uh, little uh, uh, crimps inside of it. So when you crimp it down, it actually splits the wire this way, like this. And that's how you get your IDC. Where the stranded will spread out and splay, and it's just two. Can't miss it, but you have to look closely. So we come along with jacks, and that was all fun and dandy, but as the speeds became higher and, and we started looking at collision domains, then bad connections started becoming a problem. Now, bad connections in the, in the phone companies, uh, or Western Union, where I worked as a super tech, we really didn't have those. If you think about it, we had these these wire wraps and we had solder. Uh, we had these industrial strength jack panels that we patched things in and out of. Uh, very, very beefy. We get into the modular world with just people crimping things and all of a sudden you start having these intermittent problems. And this is why I really stress how important it is to have good quality control. Even in today today's world, we, we buy patch cords in bulk and patch panels and we worry about stripping back insulation too far and trying to keep up with, you know, cat and, and, and giggy type of infrastructures that are very, very picky. But you can have a good infrastructure. It could test real well with the vendor. And a year down the road, you start experiencing um, intermittent problems. And, I, you know, even today, uh, I, last year I was doing a big install. And we had a weird intermittent problem. It was, a, uh, it was the patch cords. It was a bad batch of patch cords that were very expensive from a very reputable uh, distributor, I think it was Annex or Gray Bar or somebody like that, uh, and the patch cord started failing just from a, a, a bad crimp and bad strain relief they were starting to pull out. Uh, maybe just age, plastic pulls back over age as well. Uh, and it started introducing a lot of intermittent problems. Um, coax is another one. Uh, you might have a high-end contractor in your data center, but they might sub out uh, some of the, uh, co the connections and the cable runs they're responsible for it, but when the stuff starts to fail, or even worse, you know, you build a big plant, you have a couple of dozen feeds of coax or a couple of dozen uh, or thousands of pairs of riser, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the first few ones you start using are great. Everything's fine. Five years down the road, you start using stuff that doesn't work. Open circuits, open cable, bad connections. In this industry, you might have a, a cabling vendor that is no longer around, and you're stuck holding the bag, okay? Uh, they might, I hate to say it, but they might have fudged their uh, test reports. So a lot of times we get OTDR on fiber, and we get uh, continuity and frequency specs, and, and everything that passes on a, 
on a cable run, you might have that in a binder form, and you're looking through this, or a spreadsheet, or, a, or whatever. The, the medium might be that the, the cable installer says, here's our certification. You know, well, unless you do it yourself, you don't really know. So the point I'm making is that even the smallest little thing can have a major effect down the road. And Murphy's alive and well in our industry. You'll have that major effect. Things will start failing at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Friday night before a three-day weekend when nobody's around. right? And so your operations center or whoever's on call is going through that list trying to get somebody out on site. It's just the nature of the beast. So you try to get this stuff up front. Be as thorough as you can. Um, I'll talk briefly about uh, misnomers and how we use terminology wrong on connectors, and then I'll go on to part two uh, later on, which is going to be some T1 testing. So I talked about Ethernet being one, two, three, and six, and I really don't know and remember why that came out to be, but it lives today on Ethernet as pins one, two, three, and six. Originally, it was 212A, and it was later renamed 568B, and that's just the type of pinout that we use on the jacks and the cables to get the twists right, etc. I won't go into that. You can always Google 568B or 212A. A 212A was the AT&T designation. Um, but that's what came out. People will often use the term RJ45 inaccurately. Um, you can use the term RJ45 to express an 8-pin modular jack or plug, and I won't get upset. Um, but if you start using the rest of it uh, uh, poorly, I'll get mad. Here's an example. 568B is the wiring pinout for Ethernet. Uh, RJ, which is a registered jack, and there's lots of RJs for everything on your, your phone line, your headset, to special uh, modular jacks and connectors in a biscuit block used for security systems. Registered jack, RJ, Google that. There's uh, probably 10 or so major versions of this. T1, T1 uses RJ48C, and that's the pinout for T1. And I'll go into this a little bit more later on, but where Ethernet is pins 1, 2, 3, and 6, uh, RJ48C for T1, did I say T1 is 568B? Hmm. T1 pins out at 1, 2, uh, 4, and 5. Technically, pin 8 is the ground but the ground kind of went away a long time ago with uh, a drip wire and ground wire and, and UTP. Um, the old DDS used to be 1, 2, 7, and 8, if anybody remembers 56K DDS. But that's pretty much all gone nowadays. That used to be the early version of dial-up before AOL. Uh, and it was actually quite popular for a while. It was the fastest thing you could get. Um, even, even faster than 9.6 kilobits. No, we call it 9600 baud in my day. So anyway, Ethernet pins out differently than T1. Um, loopbacks still work the same where you take your sends and receives. I'm going to go into some loopback stuff later on. But we're talking about connectors. An 8-pin Ethernet connector is 568B. 8-pin uh, T1 is 1, 2, 4, and 5. And pin 8 is ground. On Ethernet, pin 8 is now part of PoE, but that's a different story. <clears throat> Something else that, that people use wrong, and I'll pretty much close on this, is RS-232. Now, I'll be darned if people don't you just use that wrong. RS-232 is a physical interface and protocol. It has nothing to do with what people would assume is RS-232. The back of earlier RS-232, I take that back, early RS-232 was in a 25-pin DB or D-sub connector. Okay, we've all seen these. This is this is a, a gender changer and um, null modem. And if anybody remembers the early days of RS-232, things were kind of tricky then. But RS-232 is a protocol and an electrical interface. It is not the connector. This is our this is a 25-pin DB. Uh, we generically call it our RS-232. Look at the back of uh, an older PC if you've got it. It's a DB9. And it's still RS-232, send, receive, ground, etc. RTS, uh, DCD, uh, all those pins if they're active. Um, one of my favorites, I love this one. Let's say V.35. Well, V.35 could be anything. V.35, 
well, let me back up. V.35 is another example of RS-232 gone wrong. V.35 works commonly on a Winchester connector. We all remember Winchester connectors if you've been around a little while. But you could pin that out to anything you want. Here's a, a Winchester to a big old massive guy. I think this is about a 50 pin DB, sub D. Um, Winchester can do is just a connector. Just like D sub is just the connector. D sub, okay? So if you say V.35, mean V.35. You say RS-232, tell me what flavor, okay? Let's just keep that in mind. Uh, T1 actually went through a lot of iterations too. Uh, early days of T1, it was on a 15 pin D sub. Okay? And then we modularized it. And then we came out with mod taps because a lot of the early CSUs, DSUs, uh, uh, telco handoffs, and this is really big in Europe, uh, it was all D sub. That was your D mark from a telco, was a D sub. And if you wanted to use it for your distributed plant or something that had a modular connector, then you needed generically, gosh, I'm doing it again, generically mod taps, where you'd convert from one to another or vice versa. You could either buy these pre-made, this is a Thomas Betts, it's been pre-made, or you can buy little kits and pin them yourself. And mod tap will use generically like RJ45. Mod tap will convert from one to another, and that's all there is to it. Then we got really tricky because, hey, we didn't want to dispatch people, so we started having little boxes. You could push things down to do various things. I actually adapted this a long time ago for a T1 loopback. had a critical, a chronic intermittent problem at a customer site. I was the customer. It was the remote office I had. And uh, I got tired of dispatching people. It, was a, it turned out it was a telco issue, but it was just really intermittent. So I actually modified an old telegraph box to do loopbacks. And uh, we don't do much of this today. Um, I was talking to somebody recently about looping back T1, and he had a, uh, a T1 loopback plug. And I'm going to go into that in the, the, the second half of this training, which is T1 loopbacks. Um, so for now, I think this is quite a bit. I didn't talk about a lot of the other stuff that was out there, though, you know, through the iterations of original telegraph cable. Um, there's been multiple types of coax. Anybody remember Wang systems? They used a twin coax, uh, balance, balanced and unbalanced coax. Coax in the early days was pretty tough. ArcNet worked on coax. Uh, we still use coax today as our uh, connection point for DS3s with various carriers. That's still how we connect. Uh, and they're really good. They're solid. It's a, a twist push B and C connector. Uh, it's pretty tight but it needs to be made well. It's kind of a lost art with a lot of cabling contractors nowadays. They don't crimp it right. They don't strip it right. They won't spend the, the right amount of money on the strip tool. Uh, they don't get the right size cable. They don't get the right size connectors. And, and I ran into this last year when I was on a contract to move a data center and uh, you know half the damn uh, coax didn't work. We plug stuff in and we get no signal. And I broke out my handy dandy analog meter for a continuity check and a couple of the plugs just came out of my hand. I gave it what I call my, my pull test, and it just came right off. It was not built right. So uh, it was still under construction. We were able to get the vendor out to fix that. But um, avoid intermittent problems down in the future. Build your infrastructure correct. And more than anything, please, use the right terminology. Otherwise, somebody like me is going to come along and stomp you. Thanks. Looking forward to part two here coming up in a little